be familiar with the label is is Nirvana. I think you know we put out Nirvana's first album, Bleach. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Exploring Washington State podcast. This is that part where I stumble over names, but it's I've got Becca Zeitz Flynn on. You, Becca, did I say it right, right this time? Finally, it. please say yes. Yeah, you crushed it. Yay. All right. So Becca is with, yay. Becca is with Sub Pop. And so before we get started, we have to test your credibility. All right. I'm here. I'm here for it. Sub Pop Records started in... Okay, so Sub Pop Records started in Burlington, Vermont. No, but Austin, Texas, or or Olympia, Washington. Well, I mean, theoretically, you know, at Sub Pop started in Olympia. <laughs> I will say that I did go to school in Vermont, so I okay. do have uh, some pride for Burlington. I, that's why I put that I in there. Thanks. I was going to say because yeah, your journey. Thanks for that. You, yeah, your journey. Yeah, that's a part of my journey, not Sub Pop's journey. Yes. So your journey to yeah. Sub Pop. Yes. So why don't we really quick kind of give us that that overview of of Sub Pop from from its early days, condensing all those years down into then we'll talk about like when you started there, because you said, you know, I, I believe you got a story there. So so Sub Pop, you know, Sub Pop 101 for sure. our listeners. Sub Pop 101. Um, Sub Pop is a record label that was it did it did theoretically start in <laughs> Olympia. Um, as a zine so it was called subterranean pop and that was uh founded by bruce pavitt um who was one of our co-founders of the label and then and that was in i think we were i think if we were going back that was like 1986 but sub pop's actual date as a record label is april 1st 1988 so this is our 34th year had to do some quick math um, just to make sure, because what you know, what's time and numbers right now? Um, but that is Sub Pop oh. is celebrating its 34th anniversary. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, sorry. that's. I mean, even without wow. COVID or whatever weird vortex we're in, it's you know, just in general, it's winter. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but that's when yeah. Sub Pop was founded right. and put out our first release, and since then we've been lucky enough to you know work with artists i think you know most people's point of entry into familiarity i like how i can't spend, pronounce words being familiar with the label is is nirvana i think you know we put out nirvana's first album bleach and since then have worked with artists like mud honey and soundgarden and father john misty and flea foxes and beach house and wise blood and the shins iron and wine those are some of our postal service. Those are some of our bigger artists that we've worked with and, and other, you know, we've been t tons of other artists ranging from hip hop group Shabazz palaces to rock band Mets. I mean, we've, we've spanned genres, you know, through, we kind of release everything. So right. yeah. I think, you know, sometimes people think that, people's point of entry into sub pop was like, Oh, they're a grunge label, but we've always kind of been releasing a very eclectic roster of artists. Well, I, okay. So I'm a Washington state native and you're my, my point of entry was Nirvana and um, Soundgarden because they were playing the local scene and we could see them. And then all of a sudden records came out. It was cool. So I, I kind of, lump sub pop into that admittedly so but now now sub pop is part of um is it don't i hope i say this is it warner did i get I mean, that right did i kind right? of that i mean they're a part, part we warner? they have a share in okay. sub pop but um we're partly owned by them but okay. they have no like um in, as in regards to my day to day and involvement in sub pop, I I don't deal with anything mm -hmm. with with Warner. They're not a, like involved in our uh -huh. in in any of our like business in really. Your, in, so yeah, day to day. So like the okay. the big bosses could could okay. talk about the minutia of their involvement, but I 
Like I don't, I don't deal with anyone you, you, there. You, no. All right. Well, let's let's talk about you because that's what the show's about. Really, you're, you're a sub pop uh, employee. I'm reading off of your now. Before I do this, I'm going to ask you: Is your LinkedIn up to date? Probably not, but maybe. You know it's, what? Let's get let's get weird. Let's get perfect. in there. So, I don't know. It, it, I I mostly keep it up to date. Okay. So yeah. it says. Okay, it says you're the publicity publicity international promotions manager and A and R at Sub Pop. That is all up to date. Yeah. Perfect. And then, but your email signature also mentions the the sister label, Hardly Art. Yeah. So basically, Hardly Art, first of all, is celebrating. No, <laughs> no, no. It's, it's the Hardly Art is yeah. our sister label, and it's we're celebrating <laughs> our fifteenth anniversary this year, which is really exciting. And um, we've That's kind cool. of, you know, over the years, it's kind of gone through you know, figuring out how we kind of integrate and kind of keeping it separate entities. And so now over the past few years, it really has kind of folded back into, it is its own label outwardly, but internally we kind of handle help and handle marketing and um, promotions, the same, okay. the same team. So, um, you know, two different labels separated by love. Um, but the mm -hmm. marketing component is all inter is is all intertwined with Sub Pop. So I handle press and radio, or I handle press and international radio and press for Hardly Art as well. Okay. So you you went to the University I of did. Vermont, and so Mike Mike my, my so through my filters of the world, that means you've never heard of a band called fish. That's I'm sorry. I just associate fish with the university of Vermont. I just like, to me, they're, they're like linked and I don't know why, but when we talked earlier, you said you kind of had a, a story about your journey to sub pop. Why don't you tell us how did you go from Vermont to to well, Seattle. You know, my, my journey to sub pop is the same journey to Washington. So they're one, they're one in the same. And so since this okay. is a, a Washington podcast, um, I, you know, I can kind of go into why I decided to move here and how sub pop was kind of involved in that informing yeah. that decision. Um, unfortunately, okay. I, I, I will say this, listen, music is for everyone. Fish is not necessarily sonically yeah. my go-to. I didn't, I didn't oh. actually even know who Fish was <laughs> until, I guess maybe I went to, I went to a pre-college program and there was like, there was a, one of my friends, he was very into Fish. And so I went to see them with uh -huh. my friends and like a, a bunch of my other friends, but I didn't get, you know, I just was like, oh, cool. Didn't necessarily get it. And then when I went to Ver you didn't Vermont, get it. I was like. Okay. Oh, okay. I got to learn about jam bands very quick or I won't have any friends. <laughs> so I kind of like, you know, I kind of like bought, I really, I went, I moved, when I went to school, when I moved to school, when I went to, or moved to Burlington, I went to their local record store and kind of bought some CDs. Cause I was like, I don't know anything about these bands. And, you know, I listened to them. They're good to like, I don't, I mean, I don't know if it's appropriate to say this, but smoke weed too. You know what I mean? I get it, but like it wasn't necessarily yeah, my yeah. personal jam. And so, you know, yeah. So back back in the let me interrupt you. Go so back in college. What was your personal? What 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 did you like I, back in college? I mean, musically? so I went to I went to to UVM for theater. I'm I'm a theater. I was a theater major with a film and English okay. minor. So I joked that I was like unemployable because I just was a, involved in all of the arts, you know, um, that I was like, Oh, I'm never going to get a job right. in any of the arts, but I'm just going to do all of this. Um, but I, so like I listened, you know, I mean, I think I came from like a musical theater background. So I like, you know, I mean, in, in my heart of hearts, I still very much have a soft spot for musicals, but I, you know, I, my friends and my, you know, I actually had a teacher, I was like very into indie rock when I was in high school. And he like introduced me to bands like Sonic Youth and Pavement. And I mean, honestly, probably all the bands on Sub Pop too, like Mud Honey. Like he just was a very, he just like loved music. And he was kind of a big point of entry 
But then my one of my best friends in middle school, her older okay. sister, she was in high school when we were in middle school. So they were they were like maybe five or six years apart. And she entered. I mean, she really is one of the people that I credit the most for like introducing me to like punk rock. So like she was kind of my point of entry into okay. like x-ray specs who are very important and banned to me <laughs> and you know artists like pj harvey and you know sex pistols and stuff like that that, that is kind of what's my point of entry into like punk rock and so you know i think i kind of came from more okay. of an indie rock punk rock kind of background and okay. you know at uvm when i went there like I said, I, you know, I kind of, I went, my major was theater and I was kind of, I was a, pretty involved in the theater department until I really got involved in the radio station. And that kind of took over and oh, okay. kind of really helped navigate. I mean, and really was it, was how I got to where I am now is, is my, is by doing college radio. So I ended up becoming the music director of my radio station and you know, when I graduated or was getting ready to graduate from college, I had a friend that actually her mom worked in an advertising agency. And she said, you know, she was like, oh, I think I can get you a job in New York. And I had, you know, my, I grew up in Philly. My whole family is basically from New York. I love New York. And I really thought that that was where I was going to live when I was done school. And then I lived there for like a semester and went to NYU and took a bunch of classes and and what have you and I kind of realized that I didn't want to like live in a closet with 12 other people and like not get you know I just didn't want I, I wasn't ready to have that experience and you know I really I think to me I always joke that I mean the northwest does remind me the pacific northwest does remind me a lot of like Vermont just like I think the incorporation of like Especially, I mean, Burlington, I always joke that Seattle is like the city version of Burlington, where it's like, you know, they're, they're obviously surrounded okay. by like nature and the outdoors, but it's it's urban. And so that's kind of what I wanted. And I mm -hmm. knew the radio promoter at Sub Pop at the time. Um, her name is Susan Bush, and she has since since left the company and, and gone on to do a many work at other companies and crush crush it but um i just you know i kind of realized that i would rather move to the northwest and, and intern at a, at a record label without you know and find and just find a, a job at a record store or coffee shop or whatever which is kind of what i did and then rather than that then like slogging away at the grinding grinding away at the hustle of new york city so that's kind of why um, I moved to Seattle after I graduated and I've lived here now, I guess in August will be 18 years. So that was kind of my point of entry into Washington state and why I chose to move here. But also, you know, I think I'm, I was very lucky because I think, you know, I interned at Sub Pop for maybe like three months. And, at, you know, during that time I was working at um, the old easy street records location and then also working at Chop Suey mm -hmm. in like the office there and kind of just like okay. having, having, I, you know, I probably had another job that I can't remember right now um, all at the same time. But, you know, I kind of turned my internship at Sub Pop kind of turned into a part time job um, in the radio department. And so that was kind of how I got um, associated and connected to to working at Sub Pop part time. And then at that time, they weren't ready to kind of expand their radio department. And so I, I guess I did that for like a year and they kind of realized that they weren't ready to expand their radio department. So I went to work at another record label called Suicide Squeeze. And so I worked there as the label manager for okay. four and a half years. And then unfortunately, due to some budgetary um, constraints, I, I got let go and got reconnected and to sub pop. And now in February, February 1st, I will have been there for 12 years again. So my journey, I kind of have gone full circle and returned and, um, you know, I've obviously very lucky and, and excited and 
to be, to be a part of Sub Pop. And it's, you know, it's obviously an iconic label. And, I, you know, I think, I, you know, and I love, I, I love living in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest. So what's your day to day like for your job? I mean, this is an awkward question to ask nowadays, because I think you're, I'm going to guess you're, you're working from home. So you're not going into an office. Um, so everyone's day to day is a little weird sometimes like, Oh yeah, I did this. And then I, put some laundry in, but what's, what's your day-to-day job duties for Sub Pop? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, my, I think when people think about working at a record label, they always look at it like a Judd Apatow movie where people, you know, or, or a movie where people, you know, like romanticize, like people just partying all day long or something in their office. Um, right. Especially like maybe in the golden ages of like the seventies or something, you know, I mean, we definitely are fun people. But honestly, at this point, even when we were working at an office, it's, it's you know, it does, it's not as glamorous as I think it sometimes sounds, but it's an amazing job. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of it is like, you know, checking emails and, and kind of especially because I work within three different departments, it's kind of just jumping around from different responsibilities. So mm-hmm. my, you know, my main job is doing publicity for the record label. And so, you know, I help secure national and regional coverage for our artists, you know, ranging from places like Rolling Stone or Pitchfork or Stereo Gum to like, you know, maybe smaller blogs or even just regional out like outlets like The Stranger, um, you know, different, different regional publications. So I think, I mean, it's not, you miss the glory days. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, you miss the glory days of the of the rocket. The rocket magazine in Seattle was like iconic. I, um, did, did you know, just? It yeah, was so cool. I had a friend. Well, I had a I interned at a, a um, magazine when I was living in New York, and one of the editors for the magazine used to work at the Rocket, so she would tell me stories, which I think also kind of influenced my decision to move to Seattle. Okay. Yeah. It, I, and it just, yeah, the rocket was just, well, before technology, right? Before, before you could, you know, look, look at Wikipedia or go to, go to a band's webpage and see that they're playing. It's, you know, here's their, well, back when you could see bands play, but you know, you could see that they're playing at X, Y, and Z, you know, over the next three weekends. And, and the rocket was like, I mean, we, we, we devoured it trying to figure out, okay, who's playing where, you know, and, and going through it and then reading an article about, you know, some, some local band that we, you know, we knew one or one or two of the players in the band type thing. And it was always fun to see somebody, Hey, I know them. And they're on the cover of the, of the rocket. Um, maybe, you know, it was just kind of, it was kind of fun. And uh, I've always had this romanticized um, idea that the music business is. Yeah. Just, let's just say I have a romanticized version of the music business and I know it's not accurate. I know it's, you know, it's business. It's you're like you said, you're checking emails, you're doing things. But how is publicity in in the years that you've been doing this now? How has publicity changed? Like, uh, you know, with the proliferation of social media and you know all, all Instagram and how does Sub Pop's r- role in exposing artists to the public changed? I mean, I think that it's you know, I, I think that it's it's one of those things that Sub Pop is you know, I think that we had to be like this and we've always had to be like this, but especially now throughout the pandemic, we've really had to pivot and adapt. And I think that that is one of the, the, you know, most special things, especially about the indie music community is that we really are able to pivot and, and change, you know, maybe sometimes in some cases slower than, than we should be. But I think as a collective, we really have been able to pivot and change pretty pretty drastically throughout the pandemic. I mean, I think that in our marketing, just, you know, just our marketing strategy in general, I think, you know, everything would kind of lead up to when we released a record and then a band would tour on that record. And then, you know, you know, you would be able to Mm -hmm. kind of build these like phases, continue it, you know, continue it, continual phases into a, a band's campaign based upon touring. And, you know, especially right now, I think, you know, bands are, if they do tour you're you're it's amazing that it's even happening right now you know i think and so we've kind of learned that it doesn't necessarily you know people are still 
one of the the most awesome things I think about music, right, is I think it really does help. You know, I don't want to be cliche to be like music saves, but I, you know, I think that like I know for my own purposes, you know, that it's if you put on a record, it can change your mood in a second. And I think that, you know, through the pandemic, maybe, you know, because people weren't, you know, are switching how they're spending their money. I, you know, I think that we've been lucky to see a consistent support and not really a decline. People are still engaging with our music and buying music. And even if, you know, the mail has been slower to like deliver packages or whatever, people, people are like, okay with it. You know, they're not, they're really, understanding and and supportive still in in regards to supporting music and i think you know i think now that the world you know i think now that we know that covid is kind of going to continue to like mutate and change but it's kind of i think now we're all in this place where we're realizing it's kind of here to stay you know i think people are realizing that like okay we're just going to keep getting boosted and probably figure out new ways to make sure that people are touring safely so that they can make sure that they're performing and, and going and playing live music. And I think that now we're kind of figuring how to incorporate that back into our marketing strategy. But, you know, we've been able to, for the last mm-hmm. two years, um, you know, really kind of figure out ways to keep doing what we do. And I, you know, but that's how it has always been. I mean, if you look to 15 years ago or something, you know, in the beginning of when not even like streaming services, but digital music or, you know, however long ago it was maybe 18 years ago, you know, that was a pivot. That was a big um, change for the, mm-hmm. the music industry in itself. Like just being able to download songs, you know, really, you know, everyone's like, this is going to ruin music. And, you know, I think that we're, you, you kind of just like, learn these technologies and kind of grow. And I, you know, I think that as a company, you know, in the, in the publicity department, I think really the biggest change is, is that it, it, and this has been happening even before COVID, it's just the decline of like everything, like you said, it's kind of been shifting to social media. So, you know, publications have had to learn to adapt in, in a way probably more so than any anyone because a lot of their money, a lot of their money and support comes from advertising and that now more people advertise online through like platforms like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you know, <laughs> than they do with a with a print publication even or digital publication. So, you know, I think that a lot of of that has right. kind of shifted and you know I, a lot of publications i mean i was just doing tour press for an artist yesterday and i was like oh man i didn't realize that this weekly in indianapolis is has gone away like you know this is probably the eighth or ninth weekly that has like folded and since covid and that's mm-hmm. you know i think that that's a lot to do with covid and and the fact that like these outlets generate their income through advertising and a lot of it just through shows. So if shows aren't happening, I mean, it's Mm -hmm. all just kind of like a domino effect, but you know, I think you can kind of see it in a grander scale, but to go into the minutia, you have to pick like, you know, specific examples. So like I said, like, I think for us, the biggest thing is just publications going away, but also publications starting. Like I think a lot of people, are starting to write blogs again, which is kind of like, that was like a fad that kind of happened in the early 2000s and then kind of faded away. And now I think it's kind of, I've I've been finding a lot of newer, smaller websites of just people who are just music fans and kind of just wanting to write about music that they love. And, you know, I love that because I think that it's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's super important to, you know, it's a, it's super important just to support, like, I don't, I work with any size publication to me. I'm like, if you want to write about our bands, like mm-hmm. let's do it. So yeah. Please so do. it's not, it's not like just for us. It's <laughs> like, do. it's not like, Oh, you're just at this. I'm only going to deal with the New York times or pitchfork. You know, it's like, for me, it's like, if you're, if you are excited about the stuff we're putting out, like I am excited to talk to you about it. 
Well, that's, see, and I think, you know, like I told you when I e- emailed and you wrote back, I was, I was kind of surprised, especially about how quickly it was because I, we do a lot of guest outreach and typically it's the third time I knock on the door via email that somebody will respond. The first two don't seem to go through or something. And so I was really quite surprised that you responded so quickly and have been so, so gracious. And so that for that, I appreciate that and kudos, but I think that I, I agree with you. I think people are, you know, they're, they got a little bit more free time. They probably have streamed everything on Netflix and they don't know what to watch anymore. And now they're going back to music and going, Oh, I really miss listening to, let's just say fish. Um, just because, you know, it's a jam band and you're going through and you're listening to that, that live, that live fish show from the gorge in 1999. Oh, I remember I was there, blah, blah, blah. Cause it does invoke, you know, music invokes memories. It invokes emotion. And we, there's people out there that like to share those with, with other people of like mind. So I do think blogging is kind of making a comeback as well. Yeah. And I, yeah. Let me ask you, even those, Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. We're, we're having a choppy connection today, so I apologize. Um, no, I was go just going to say that that's you know I think that that is really important that just that connection, and I think you know especially for people who you know maybe are quarantined or you know are kind of maybe hunkering down closer to home with people that you know I, especially with their kids, right? Like I think that people who you know I I think we have more time to kind of engage in a way that we haven't been able to engage and not that I would want a pandemic, a global pandemic for on anyone, you know, I wouldn't wish this on, on the world, but (laughs) you know, I think it is. And I think that, you know, I've been trying to think about the positives from this and, you know, I, you know, I think I, I shared this with you before, but my, you know, I, I definitely did not realize I realized I was going to be having a pandemic baby um, but you know, my daughter was born in the, at the end of January in 2020. And so I think right now has been really fun because she really loves music and, you know, she went through a period of a phase okay. where she would only listen to wheels on the bus, but like, you know, and, I, and I'm here for it. I get it. You got to listen to kids music, but like, you know, now she's been listening to just, we've been playing her different music at our house and like, it's just fun to watch her kind of just feel the beat and kind of you know, she's, she's still so young. I mean, she's only two that it's still, you know, this is not, maybe she'll remember this or maybe she won't. But I think that as years go on, you know, she'll ha- be able to to say, oh yeah, I have, you know, all of this, these musical experiences or memories. And I think that that's super meaningful because, you know, we are spending a lot of time I mean, we do, we, we go out when it's not raining, but we spend a lot of time at home because she's not vaccinated and we're trying to like I mean, it's probably inevitable that we're all going to get yeah. covid but i just am trying Minimize to, to, that to re- avoid that it risk. if i can not go word absolutely no i'm chuckling because you know you 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 just said you're exposing your daughter to lots of music and whether she remembers it but subconsciously when she's 18 she's like why am i drawn to this this is old why do i like this <laughs> you know cuz like my kids both of my kids I probably played the clash way too often around them because they both like the clash and they're not of the age group that would necessarily get that right off the bat, but they both do. So I think it's kind of, you can impact your child's musical taste in in interesting ways. So that's, I think it's kind of cool. Does from a promotional standpoint, is there much different in the way you promote a band in the United States as you would outside of the States? I mean, not really. When we create a marketing plan, it's mostly from a global level. So like we, you know, I think one of the things that you kind of have talked about is like, we've had to pivot and kind of reestablish how, I mean, we really do cater all of our releases specifically to an artist campaign. It's not, I mean, there are, there's things that we do, for every artist, but the, you know, we try, it's not, every campaign is not the same, you know? I mean, and, and unfortunately, you know, it's always our goal mm-hmm. to introduce our artists to a larger, um, you know, 
to a larger audience, but you know, there is just sometimes a serendipitous things that happen for an artist, right? Like we, like I said, like we usually typically send out three to four songs before now, you know, before an album is launched in some, in some cases we do pre album, pre album tracks. So an, a track will be on the album, but we don't announce the album. We share a new song mm-hmm. And that kind of goes into all the DSPs, so like into Spotify and Amazon and Apple and all all the other ones as well. And then, you know, I think, and then, you know, once we announce the record, then, you know, we kind of send out, you know, different, all those different tracks throughout the rest of the campaign until the record comes out. And there's usually videos associated with that. But like I said, sometimes there's just a serendipitous thing that like connects with a, a larger audience that... Um, you know, I think, I, I, I think a lot of it has to do because our marketing team is awesome, but it just also has to do with just the, the way the music connects with people. And so, you know, yeah, I wish that all of our artists blew up like Nirvana or, you know, but I think that there's, that's just, sometimes it's just a time and a place for people. Right. How many people approximately? I'm going to ask you like how many people are on the marketing team and then I'll throw in approximately not to put you on the spot and go, Oh, it's, you know, but how big a team do, does some have? our marketing team is around 20 and that includes like press and radio and film okay. and TV licensing and retail and social marketing and, and, and all of that stuff. Um, but I think that comp- the company itself, I think that there might be around 65 to 70 people. Um, I, I haven't, it's been seconds since I counted, but that's also, okay. you know, we also have um, two physical locations. One is located at SeaTac Airport. So we have an airport s- store. And then we also have a physical mm-hmm. location that's kind of um, on Amazon's campus um, that is on 7th Avenue in downtown Seattle. So right. that includes, I think that people that work at, people that work at the airport store also work at that physical location too. So I think that that's how many people we have at Pop, but I haven't counted our list in a second. Okay. Well, let's talk about the, the, the store. Do you, do you know much about the, how the airport store came to be just out of, I, I don't know, expect that you would necessarily, but just out of curiosity, do you know how the airport store came I, to be? You know what? I don't, I mean, I, I don't know that the actual history of like, you know, and how, how those conversations kind of got started. I know that, you know, the, the port of Seattle has always been really involved in the music community. And I think, you know, we, um, I mean, you can hear it. Anyone who's flown in and out of SeaTac knows that there's always music played. You can hear Mark Arm from Mudhoney or many, Mm -hmm. many musicians um, on and off Sub Pop kind of doing those, um, those overhead announcements. Yeah. Those PSAs. PSAs. You got it. You got to love them. Um, yeah. and I think that the, those kind it kind of s- sprung from that. I think our CEO, Megan Jasper kind of, um, it was through a relationship through with the port, um, and, and wanting the, and SeaTac kind of wanting to expand and to, and bring in more local vendors that I think that that kind of, um, is, was our, mm-hmm. our point of entry, but I, you know, Megan and the, the rest of the sub pop brass would know better of, of all the minutia than I would. I, I just remember my first time walking through the airport and I was going somewhere and I, I saw this, I mean, what? And I like went into the store and I'm like, why is there a record store at the airport? Oh wait, this is kind of cool. And, and it was, it was, I always just thought it was really an interesting place to put a, a record store, but it is so iconic to Seattle that it makes perfect sense it, when you think about it, but my knee jerk reaction, but it made me stop and go in, which I think is the goal is to get people to stop, go in and um, find something there to buy and listen to and learn. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> I haven't flown in a while, so I haven't seen it in a while. So I, maybe it's changed. Maybe you've changed. I, mean, we, I, I know, know we did. We did do a little bit of a, of a, makeover um pre-pandemic and and i actually have not i have not flown 
since September 2019, which is weird because I used to fly it all the time, but it is pretty awesome. And, um, you know, I think what's really cool is that it, you know, I, Sub Pop, and, and we're lucky because Sub Pop is not only just a record label, but it's a brand. I think it's a name, especially in music, that people kind of recognize. So, you know, I think that, I think that that was a really, it's been, and it's like you said, is really important to the history of music in the Pacific Northwest, but especially in Seattle. So I think, you know, that has been really awesome to connect mm -hmm. with just like a, a bigger audience and, and being able to like, I mean, one of the things that I do miss from working at a record store, like, you know, a lot of times I would go sell merch with our bands on the road or when they're in Seattle is that it's just like you, you kind of, okay are doing so much behind the scenes that you forget it, it, it just like it, it just hits you in a different way when you see people engage with the brand or the you know the brand itself but also the music and you forget like whoa like there's people buying even though i know consciously that there are people buying the music that we're promoting i it's when you get to connect with it on a on a first-hand basis it definitely is more meaningful and you realize like whoa this is what i do and it's it makes, to be honest with you, it makes me appreciate my job a little bit more. All right. So now I'm going to ask you some, these are personal opinion questions. Okay. So there's no wrong answer. Okay. Okay. In your opinion, right now, who is somebody at Sub Pop on, on the label that people should be listening to that they might not be listening to? Hmm. That's a, that's a good one. I mean, there's a lot of artists that probably people are unfortunately not listening to and they should be listening to. So check out our Spotify playlist. And, um, huh? I mean, maybe for selfish reasons, because I signed yeah. this band to the label, um, we work with this, this, I don't want to call them postponed cause they'll be bad at me for saying that, but, but in all intents and purposes, probably that's the best okay. descriptor of them, but this British band called TV priest, and um they're okay. they're just awesome and i think that they you know they re we released their their debut record last year and they're currently working on some new tunes so hopefully we'll have more more to share for um this year and yeah i mean that band i think is awesome i also really there's this there's this uh folk singer okay. Once again, I sometimes don't like describing, like, I, I guess don't like describing because sure. it sounds very generic, but there's this um, woman named Shannon Lay, and her record that came out last year is honestly one of my favorite records. Probably was one of my favorite records that we put out last year, and okay. she, it, it, that record is really special, and I feel like I, I, would, I would love for more ears to be on listening to her because I think that she's a really amazing singer and songwriter but also just like an amazing person like she's just one of those people that when you're around her you, the world just gets a little bit better but honestly like i really feel very lucky okay. to work at a label where um i mean all of our bands are awesome and you know i think that's you know maybe that's the difference of between not to not to diss any major labels, but like that's one of the differences between working at a major label and working at a indie label is that I feel, especially being a part of the A and R staff, so I kind of am have a hand of like mm -hmm. being, you know, not only pitching artists that I would like to bring in to the label and work with, but also to get, you know, put my my feedback of artists that my coworkers are pitching and wanting to work with as well. So I just feel really lucky that we work with a roster of artists that are very, I mean, musically they're awesome, but also just very like-minded, rad people. So I'm probably a little biased, obviously, but I definitely think a point, an awesome point of that's, entry that's... is to listen to our Spotify um, playlist that we do. Okay. Can you walk us through, you said you signed a band. Yeah that can you walk us through the process of that? Like, how did you, they're British. So you didn't go down to the pub in London and see them play and go, Oh, these, th this band is awesome. I want to, I want to sign them. So how did this process in, you know, high level, how does a process work from finding a band to 
vetting them, if you will, signing them and then releasing. Yeah, something. I mean, the, you know, at every label, the A&R process is pretty different. But at Sub Pop, um, it's a committee of around 10 of us ranging from, you know, the owner, you know, co-founder and, and co- co-president of the label, Jonathan Poneman, our CEO, Megan Jasper, um, co-president, Tony, Tony Keywell, and a bunch of other people that do different things. So there's people who do radio and then also do retail and then publicity and international marketing like myself. And we meet in production and we meet once a week and we kind of share music mm-hmm. that we're into. And so it's a, it can sometimes be a very slow process and also frustrating process because you can be very into a band and people not are not into it. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I've, mm-hmm. I've been very lucky. I guess I've been on the A&R staff now for maybe eight years. Um, and I've, you know, I've been able to work with and sign, okay. a, you know, a number of artists that, you know, I think one of the the most meaningful things and, and exciting things is when you get to sign an artist and you kind of watch them go through that process of blowing up and, and, you know, go from that process of selling like 5,000 copies of a record to almost a hundred thousand copies of a record or more. And I think that, you know, I feel very lucky to be able to, you know, be able to project manage those projects. So I think, you know, the way that you get pitched, I mean, people send in demos all the time. And I, you know, I've admitted this in other interviews, so I'll admit it here, but I I have a few, I have this um, belief that if someone finds my email and takes the time to actually like address me in an email, like, Hey, Becca, here's my new record. I always listen to it. If someone's just sending a, a generic form letter okay. and don't address me, sometimes I might not be able to listen to it. But, um, you know, I think if someone takes the time to actually like explain who they are, the music that they make and what have you, it, you know, I think that that is super meaningful and, and important. And so, you know, for me, I, you know, I find out about new bands from all different avent places, you know, from, a lot of places from like stereo gum, you know, from just outlets, stereo gum, pitchfork, Bandcamp, just listening to a ton of stuff on Bandcamp or Spotify to, you know, getting pitched an artist, an artist directly from the band or from their manager or lawyer, or, you know, just being a fan of a band Mm -hmm. and just kind of like wanting to work with them. And so, the way that I came to, to sign TV Priest was that my coworker in, in the UK, uh, he actually credits his wife. So I'm going to credit his wife. His wife um, fa- was listening to the BBC and she sent it, to, you know, she shared it with her husband. And then her husband, you know, kind of shared it with a few of us in the A&R department. And, you know, we just kind of immediately like fell in love with it. And so, you know, we kind of connected with their managers oh. and it just kind of was went from there. So, you know, I think every point of entry for an artist is kind of different, but that's kind of how TV priests were signed to the label. Okay. You, you said that if somebody finds your email address and they take the time to personalize the communication with you, you'll listen to what they, they send you. Yeah. Has there been any, really creative because then you said you also said sometimes they send you a form letter and, and those you might listen to you might not you know has there been any like over the top creative ways that a band or their management has done outreach that you've seen i mean not by email i think that back in the day people used to send you know like okay booze or like I, one time we got a package of like candy <laughs> and like little like street. I mean, you know, people used to send that and we kind of have changed our submission process since <laughs> then. So uh, if you're listening and looking to submit, go to our, mm-hmm. go to subpop.com because all that information is there. Um, but, you know, all I mean, right. you would be surprised how many times people just kind of cut and paste an email and, you know, and don't really take the time to, to, look over what they're sending, you know, and I kind of see it. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I think if, if I were a musician and I was a creative, 
I, I can't imagine being creative, you know, working, working on my music, improving my craft, if you will, to the point where I want to submit it to see if, if a label would be interested and then just sending, you know, dear sub pop, dear, dear Warner, dear, you know, it, you know, and just crossing out, you know, sub pop and placing in another label and just the same text over and over again. I wouldn't think that that would catch anybody's eye. Um, so I can't imagine that. Yeah, I don't. I would do it differently. I, I would. I don't know what I would do, but I, I think I'd try to be a little bit more engaging and at least spark. Let's say you're the one reading it, spark your curiosity to at least listen. Yeah. To see what's there, to see if there's something. Yeah, I mean, I think that it is. It does. I think so, it is important to try to set yourself apart, but also I think it's important to, you know, I always tell bands or anyone you know sometimes people will just reach out and ask me like hey how do I get signed to a label and I always say that it's important to start local I think you can't just be a band and then like sometimes maybe I mean now especially because everything has changed that like touring is not as important you know it's I mean touring is very important and playing shows is too but there's different ways to build an audience like you've been Mm -hmm. like we've been saying right like building social numbers and and what have you a present social presence and so I think that everything has kind of changed and pivoted and moved around. But I think, you know, I think you got to show initiative. You can't just make a a music and just be like, Hey, I'm going to put this out in the world and get signed to a label. And I think sometimes maybe that happens if the music is special enough and, and kind of stands out. But I also think that like building a, a, an online presence, building a, building a fan base, it, is super important. And to me, I always say like, especially for local artists, like taking advantage of, you know, the resources that we have, not only in just Seattle, but in Washington state, I think that like, you know, making sure that you are servicing the different weeklies or, you know, I mean, especially because KXP is based here, like making sure you're sending KXP your record and trying to get played on the radio and trying to like, Mm -hmm you know, when it's, when, it, when you feel comfortable or safe to play a show, trying to engage with the local venues and, you know, making sure that you're mm-hmm. sending your record to not only just, you know, the stranger, but like to and Seattle times, but making sure that you're servicing the local regional like blogs and stuff like that. I think trying to build something on your own, you know, and showing an initiative that you're, you're mm-hmm. serious about this project and, and wanting this to be a thing. I think that that does say a lot and, you know, sub pop and other record labels are looking and following, especially what is going on locally. So, you know, I think that, you know, it's a team right. thing, right? Like it's not a, a band doesn't just like get signed to a label. It's like a, you know, we're, we're in agreement that we're working together to enhance their art is how I always look at what my job is. Right. You're, you're, you're teammates. It's a relationship. Your, your, your label's not successful without good artists and the artists aren't going to get as the promotional, um, and awareness created if without a good label that's got, got their back. I think it's, it's, there's gotta be the synergy between, between both. One question I always ask um, guests that are like musicians. So I'm going to ask you because you're you're a music lover. So going to rewind back pre-COVID. You know, go back happier days. Where in the Seattle area did you like to see music be performed? Man, I mean, I would. You know, I think that there's something special about all of the venues that we have in Seattle. But I think. Um, you know, I really enjoyed and I, and, and they have since they've since made it over. And actually I don't think that they've opened yet, but the sunset, I really enjoyed watching shows there. And then also, I guess, I guess new okay. um, is also an amazing venue that I really okay. enjoyed seeing shows at. I like yeah. the bigger venues that we have, but I think, you know, I think that it's maybe the smaller ones or ones that I find, especially if it, depending on what the show is that I found, like I've had some of the most, you know, meaningful, like I probably knew was to be honest with you. I've, I've left feeling the most inspired after seeing shows. Okay. 
my my mine in Seattle I, that I've always not always well yeah uh, the tractor tavern I've always liked the tractor I don't know why Lo- logistically it's not the best room I you know it's it's not but there's something about the tractor tavern um, that I've always enjoyed now back in the day back in the 80s you know, Seattle has some really great rooms that are no longer uh, no longer in existence, but like Astor Park and in the Hall of Fame and places like that were just amazing. That was way before your time, so you know, don't even yeah. But we that was Seattle was fun in the early eighties. It was uh, the Seattle music scene in the early eighties was really I do, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I wish that I got I did get to see that, um, and I do miss the old crocodile, and I'm excited to see what this new croc looks like. I have yet to venture out and see it but um i don't know i mean that the sight lines in that room were really bad in the first you know in the first crocodile but i think you know it just you felt it was just an icon i mean that was probably the first place that i saw that was one of the first places that i saw a show and, and it was a destination location i felt like you, you felt like you were a part of history and I think, you know, it was kind of like the first time I went to CBGB's okay. where I was like, whoa, I'm a part of like, you know, I, I remember seeing a very oh. weird show at CBGB's, but I still felt like, whoa, this is like, I'm a part of like history. Although I will never history. go into the, you know, that bathroom was disgusting. Uh, so how, how lo- but that was probably a part of history too. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, probably. Okay, so we're all Washington State based, but I'm gonna just break my rule here. You gotta, you gotta. I the CBGB. Come on, tell me more. I've never been there, and some of my favorite bands back in the day, you know, played there a lot, and I've always just had it on this historical pedestal, like it was, like. I mean, it yeah, basically I reminded me a lot. Please tell me lot more. How of, was it? <laughs> of the old crocodile. Except with the weird, what was that weird? I mean, okay. what was it in the crocodile? It was like a weird, like snake thing. I don't remember. I remember that there was just a weird thing that was hanging from the top that was like there, and there was a beam that was like in a sight line right. that you couldn't really see. But I mean, it was just a black, yep. dingy room that like just felt gross. I mean, it smelled beyond uh. beer and pee and you know i mean it just smelled gross and like but you felt like man this is where all of these you know the remote i mean just like this is where all these bands started yeah a lot of you know really large musical acts from the late 70s and 80s got they played there i mean it was it was an iconic room to 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 aspire to. And I think in Seattle, the crocodile is one of those equivalents, you know, Seattle's version is, you know, the crocodile um, is one. Of, and I haven't been to the, you know, I haven't gone and seen the new one. I'm curious what it looks like. It I'm sounds sure it's awesome. Cool. I mean, I've seen pictures um, and it looks awesome. I just, um, I was invited, to, invited to go see it and I just haven't felt, felt safe enough to kind of leave my, my dwelling. Okay. Yeah. You're dwelling. Are you, uh, uh, my other question for all my guests is are, a coffee. Are you a coffee fan? And you know, if not, we have to have another further conversation, but are you, a, a are you a coffee fan? fan? And I got to tell you, I do m- sometimes miss going out to get coffee. Cause I still, that's one of the things I don't do it very often these days, right. but I do love coffee. So, so the next time I visit Seattle, where should I go for coffee? I mean, I will tell you that even though this is, well, this is what they have a location in West Seattle, but I honestly will tell you that I think that the best coffee in the Pacific Northwest is Olympia coffee. I think what they are, those beans are, are okay. yeah. beautiful. And I think that personally, um, okay. that's probably my favorite coffee roaster in, in the Northwest. Um, Mostly because they're light, they're light okay. blends, and I'm not. I mean, I used I used to live very close to Lighthouse Coffee, and so I love Lighthouse Coffee. But they are they they go dark. They're dark roasters. It sounds evil, but I like it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that they Olympia Coffee is probably my favorite coffee, and they have um, a shop in West Seattle. 
but I, you know, mm-hmm. they have yeah, one they in have, Olympia, yep, and they also um, <laughs> closer to where I live, they have um, Olympia Coffee is sold at Burien Press, so that's kind of where I go to get Olympia Coffee these days. Oh, okay. Okay. I will give you credit in all the times that I've asked that question. You are the first person to bring up Olympia coffee. I mean, I will tell you that people need to and get it's in a, there. It's a, it's a well-known established. Yeah. I think that they're the best. I think that they got. Yeah. I, I used to, uh, I used to work in Olympia. I think so. that they got nominated for the best roast, like one of the best roasters in the Northwest a few years ago. Like they're, I'm a little disappointed in your guests, yeah. I guess. Yeah. No, they well, I'll, I'll see. I like darker roast coffee, so their their roasting profile doesn't fit my palate. I appreciate the craft that they're doing. I think they're an an outstandingly uh, well run company. Great coffee, great representative of coffee. Kind of like you didn't get jam bands, right? You can kind of like, oh, yeah, I see their point, but not for me. That's kind of the way I am with their coffee. I tend to like the the. Uh, darker roasts uh that's kind of my thing but uh they're a cool company their 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 location in olympia was a lot of fun to go to it wasn't too far from from my office so i'd go in there and, and their big truck uh blend was something i would drink and be oh yeah quite that one with. is a good one i like little buddy yeah okay okay and then um so I, let's let's wrap this up because we got to respect your time. For you, what do you think we'll see from Sub Pop in the near future? I mean, is what what do you think? You know, here's your crystal ball. You know, forecast the music world. What do you think we're going to start to see? Is there any any changes coming that you are seeing over on the horizon or anything like that? I mean, I think it's hard to to tell and know how we're going to you know, evolve just as an industry, you know, even though I know we will, I think that obviously right now, social media, like TikTok and Instagram, but especially TikTok is kind of really the way that they've chosen to incorporate music. It really is a big, um, has, has kind of shown a big pivot in, in the music industry. I mean, you can kind of like how people, can kind of blow up and become famous on YouTube. It's kind of the same thing. You can kind of blow up and, and, and a song can really kind of take off in, in a way that's, that's very unique to, to, to the platform on TikTok. And I think, you know, one of the things, like I said, is that Sub Pop has always kind of been a leader in following those, those musical trends. But, you know, I think that one of the things that will always mm-hmm. stay consistent is that we will always put out awesome quality music that people you know, that we believe in and hope other people can kind of engage with. And I think, you know, this year, especially we have, it's a very, you know, big, we have big releases that are coming out this year. And, you know, we're starting the year off very big okay. with, you know, we, you know, in the beginning of the year, we announced a new Father John Misty record. And next month on the 18th of February, we're releasing a new Beach House record. So, you know, those with more bigger records to be announced throughout the year. So I think, you know, this year is going to be a very busy, I mean, it's always a busy year, but it's going to continue to be a very busy year for, for sub pop and, and our artists. And I think, you know, will be, you know, I think it will be interesting to see how the, you know, touring world kind of redefines what the what the music industry looks like because honestly a lot of venues and you know a lot of venues unfortunately closed or changed ownership during covid um and are still re you know defining themselves i think you know one of the things that i think people probably don't realize right is like when you go to a show of course a show if a show is sold out that i'm sure you know, I don't know how the exact bookkeepings, but from working at a, a at a numerous venues over the years, you know, I can tell you that a lot of the times the way that the venue makes money is, is in the same way that like a movie theater makes money is through concessions, right? So a bar, you know, a venue makes money mm-hmm. because of a bar. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see how mm-hmm. these venues kind of redefine and grow and, and kind of you know, how that affects everything, because, you know, maybe people aren't wearing 
<laughs> masks. Maybe people are out there like just drinking beer, not wearing masks like they used to. But I can tell you the next time I go to a show, whenever that is, I for sure will be wearing a mask and probably not taking it off the whole mm -hmm. show. So, you know, I think that that's, whereas, you know, maybe I would get one drink and that, you know, during a show, I think that that's going to, that's going to evolve and change. And it will be interesting, you know, to me, what I think is exciting is I always love really like DIY spaces. Um, and while, you know, we talked about mm -hmm. venues that I love, I think it will be interesting to see like, you know, the creation and establishment of like new smaller DIY spots that kind of pop up. And, you know, to me, those are, those are kind of those shows, you know, where there's maybe 50 or a hundred people like crammed into a, a room. Those are the shows that I kind of miss the most, but it's hard for me to con think about <laughs> returning into a, in, into that right. environment, you know? <laughs> Right. No, I, I can agree with that. <laughs> just we'll all be wearing like, you know, hazmat suits or something like that. That would kind of change the change the experience. So last question, which is what I've been ending my shows with a lot lately because it's the it's it's my it's my way of cheating. So what didn't I ask you that I should have asked you? I don't know. I think we covered all of our bases. I feel like. I feel like I, I got okay. to give you probably okay. stumbled across, uh, stumbled on some words. So apologies, listeners, for my lack of oh. being able to verbalize myself very early in the morning look, with only. Look. I'm going to be honest. I actually have not finished my coffee yet today, so that's probably why. Um, but oh my gosh, you know, I feel like this was oh, that explains yeah. so much. No, just kidding. I mean, I feel like it. You know, listen, I I shared that <laughs> I have kidding. a little one, so I feel like I get that's an excuse. Good. Yes, um, you do. And anybody that's listened to the show is not expecting NPR. Certainly not from me. So it's you're you're you've been, you've been great. This has been fun. Well, no, I appreciate you. In um, we're oh, gonna put sorry, some go links. Ahead. No, I was just gonna go say ahead. thank you, thank you nope, for you're... inviting me to be a part of the show and for reaching out. And um, you know, obviously, on a personal level, I have a very deep love of Washington State and. Seattle, Seattle area, but also, you know, obviously it's always an honor to be able to talk about the company that I work for and the bands that, you know, I, that I work on their behalf. And I definitely think, you know, I think it can become overwhelming when you, to, to know where to start with, with just music. Sometimes I, I even get overwhelmed if I'm looking at Spotify, like, oh my God, like I actually did, I actually fought streaming services for a long time because I was like, I don't like having access to that much music at all times. Um, it just kind of stressed me out. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and, and I probably have a couple thousand records in my house. I don't know. I mean, you know, I do have access to thousands of music, but just inf infinite amounts of music kind of stress me out. And, you know, I've, I've le since leaned in more, but, you know, I think it is really meaningful when you get to kind of share the story of, you know, of your a personal story of how you come to a place, but also a company that you love and admire and artists that you get to work with. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you for making it happen. And I'm looking forward to uh, keeping an eye on what sub pops putting out in the next, the rest of the year, since you've teased that it's going to be a big year, we'll have to, we'll have to keep an eye on it, but we'll put links um, to sub pop and uh, maybe even a link directly to the you know, if somebody wanted to submit their, their music to review, we'll find that link and put it there for them so we can save them a step. We won't publish your direct email address. Well, if they find that, Appreciate they got to do that on their own. We're not going to help them that much. But yeah, um, but no, so thank you so no, much for making this so happen. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.